Thank you for being here. My name is Michelle Pekansky Brock. Welcome to this, the uh, folks who are joining us virtually. We're happy that, that you are with us. I do have a resource site set up for this talk and the URL is on the screen. You're also gonna see the URL repeated at the bottom of some slides, so in case you miss it, look there, okay? Um, this presentation, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. This presentation has had a few different evolutions. This is the third time I've given it and I've learned um, that I'm one of those people that can never give the same presentation twice. No. This is called okay. Sorry, I was hearing some sound as I move around, but that's weird. Is that disturbing to you? Oh, it's the band. I have a mechanical heart valve, and I actually thought it was my heart valve, so sorry. It's happened before, so I was like, is that my valve? That's how it feels in my body when you're embodied as me. Um, okay, so straddling the chasm. We're, gonna, we're here to talk about a lot of the, the notions related to innovation that Kathleen Ives was sharing at the start of the keynote session. If you were able to hear her, it was kind of loud. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot of themes come about here. How many of you in this room, in some capacity, consider that your role or a significant part of your role is to support faculty? Okay, so if your hand just went up, I want you to say, in your mind or out loud, I am in a change management role. How many of you report into academic affairs? How many of you report into IT? How many of you report into both in some way? Yeah. How many of you feel like, I don't really know what my role is, but this is what I do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we're, we're all in a very similar boat. Um, start with a little context. 2005, we had a really exciting moment. We had a pope that was um, appointed in 2005. And this is an image of the moment. Our new pope in 2005 was about to step out and greet the people. We had another pope inducted in 2013. And this is an image from the same point of view that shows the people getting ready to greet the new pope. I love this image um, because it captures so much, you know, not just about technology adoption, not just about, you know, mobile, the mobile generation. It, 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 I think what it does to me is that it reminds me of, they're not phones. <laughs> Why we call them phones, I don't know. Um, they're not, they're, they're devices that people use to document their experiences and share them with the world and connect to other people. And that's what I take away from this. Now I have a little story to tell you um, about my son. This is my son, Jack. He was born in 2000. So he was five years old when that first picture was taken. He was 13 when that second photograph was taken. He's 16 now. And the story that I have to share with you is from when he was seven. That's him on the left and his little brother on the right and me in the middle. I know I can't really see that very well. So when Jack was seven, he got a video camera for his uh, I don't, birthday or Christmas. And it was a handheld flip video. Anyone remember those? pre, you know, smartphone days. So it was a little video with a, a USB clip and it was handheld. So he got this video camera and he was really excited and he went, ran off with this video camera and by the end of the day he came to me and said, Mommy, I made my first video. We put it on YouTube. And as a mother who was just started, this is 2007, just trying to figure out what YouTube meant, the idea of my son putting a video on YouTube, I, all kinds of red flags went off because I, first of all, didn't know what the video was of. And secondly, really didn't understand why he'd want other people that we didn't know to see it. So we worked through it a bit and I did end up putting his video on YouTube. I'm gonna show you a clip of it. This is actually, and his brother's playing a supporting role. Why do you play it so close? Cool? Gonna evolve, yay! Him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Click at somebody. Don't hit me. Jab you the rest of your closest. Here he goes. Can I be double you? Yeah, he does. Well, on his head. What's that a video of? Pokemon. On what? Does anyone, can you guess? A handheld yeah. DS, thank you. So what's he doing? He's sitting there playing Pokemon on a DS with his little flip video and he's recording his screen. He's making a screencast. 
This is my seven-year-old in 2007. I didn't know what screencast was at the time. But the bigger point here is that he wanted to put it on YouTube. That video today has over 20,000 views, <laughs> 11 likes, 21 dislikes, and seven comments. To this day, I can't tell you how proud of this video he is. <laughs> it occurred to me long after this, it took me a long time to allow this to resonate. It occurred to me that, you know, my son, when he was given that piece of technology, the first thing he wanted to do was give back to the community that he was learning from. YouTube is where he was going to learn how to play Pokemon, to figure out where to evolve the characters. So he was really proud of the fact that he had something to give back. And you know, not only did he have the skills with his game, but he had the tools to be able to do so. He was stepping into the role of a teacher. Wow, that's pretty powerful stuff. Now, with that said, Jack has now gone through many years of school, right? Every year in June, he comes home and puts something that this is actually one of his bundles at the end of a school year. He drops it on the floor, tosses his backpack to the side, and he's off for the summer. And then it's usually around early August when I go, OK, what do we do with this? <laughs> and he says, get rid of it. I don't need it anymore. And that's really what I, where I want us to start this conversation. If we're all in this situation of changing teaching and learning, supporting faculty, and again, I'm going to really deconstruct the notion that it's just about faculty, it's about everyone. Um, and we really want higher education to be student-centered. We need to fill that gap, okay? This is a beautiful image by Brian M. Mathers. You can follow him at Visual Thinkery. Um, actually, at Brian Mathers, but Visual Thinkery is his, is his site. And it shows, I don't know if you can see that very well, the left is a model of centralized instruction, and the right is a model that he's referring to as broad, a broad network of creativity, and this is based on the ideas of Joey Ito. Um, this is very much where we're headed. So having this, um, you know, this presence at the center or somewhere in this broad network of creativity versus the type of learning that higher education, I should say education, has been rooted in and in very, mu very much still is um, still rooted in. If anyone has an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand? Thank you. So here we have it. Here we have it, the chasm. And I'm making some statements with this image, subtle. You'll notice that one side looks a little sunnier and lively than the other. <laughs> So um, I'm hoping that we're going to be moving to that left side, That's, and that we're moving towards creating experiences that are very student-centered. So I'm going to now, basically what I've done is I've, I've um, taken a risk and I've identified five organizational barriers that I see across higher education. Now this is based upon my interactions with lots and lots of people much like you in these dual, multiple roles over, over years. I've taught faculty development online for many years, uh, supporting the California Community College system. Um, now I'm doing online faculty development and support at CSU Channel Islands, as well as those that I interact with on Twitter and through my blog. Okay, so that's where I'm taking these from. So I want us to ask ourselves, what is it that's preventing us from improving this problem? What are those barriers? Now, as I go through these barriers, some of you may say, okay, she didn't say cost, which is obvious. There are some, there are some things that, that I think we, we know and that we have dialogues in motion about. I'm trying to get deeper than those. I'm trying to get into the organizational barriers that we often don't recognize. So here we go. Um, the first one that I see that is, <laughs> this is hard to explain, so I'm gonna do my best. What I call a culture of smallness. What do I mean by that? So let this sit with you, because I think the more you think about this concept, I'm hoping it's going to start to make more sense. Um, on the left, you see a culture of smallness. And on the right, you see a culture of what I'm calling bigness. We construct things. We construct ways about working in higher education that continue to maintain this culture of smallness. And I think one of the really important pieces of this, about moving from this culture of smallness to the culture of business, if you think about a theater or you think about an arena, I'm going to challenge my Brene Brown here. How many know Brene Brown's work? 
Yes. <coughs> um, you can either be in the seat or you can show up and be seen, be in the arena, be on the stage. It feels very different. And when you're in your seat, it's really easy to judge the other people and critique them that are up on the stage, right? But you can also get up on the stage or go into the arena and um, really armor up. <coughs> which is what we tend to do. And trust me, last night as I was laying in bed, I wanted to redo every presentation I was doing today <laughs> because I started go that's what happens. When you're going into this space and you're taking off your armor and you're, you put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable, it's scary as hell. But what's so important about understanding vulnerability is that it's where innovation and creativity happens. I mean, anyone's an artist knows this. <laughs> We have to put our, be willing to put ourselves out there. And I find in higher education, and it's, it's the nature of how we've gotten here. We've been taught to be these, you know, we're supposed to know everything. But that's something that we really need to work on. We know that we run from it, and so what we have to do is really take a step forward, put ourselves out there, model that for other people. And another thing about um, vulnerability, Quote, Brene Brown quote, it's the first thing that I want to see in you, and it's the last thing I want you to see in me. That's the way human action, interaction wants, works. It's always, it's always viewed as something courageous, but it always feels like, you know, oh, kill me now. And the thing, another important point here is that, you know, no one knows how to do this. We are moving through a point in time in the history of education. You know, we have the tools in front of us to revolutionize everything. No one has the answer. That's actually great, you know, because it gives us access to the conversation. That's what it is. It's a conversation. These aren't. And so that's what I mean by this culture of smallness and a culture of bigness, kind of move from small to big. So keep that in mind because I think you'll start to see that repeated with some of these other notions. Okay. Perceptions of faculty. Um, this is an image by Kyle Bowen. <laughs> faculty against virtually everything. The number of conversations that I've been a part of where we talk about a great idea and it ends with, oh, my faculty won't do that. They're not engaged. They don't want to change. That has to go out the window because, first of all, you're wrong if you say that. There are people out there who not only want to change, but there are people out there who are already doing it on your campus. And if we focus on this, all of those people don't have access to this conversation. Um, this is an image that Phil Hill shared uh, from Mindwares, and it shows kind of this concept of the chasm in the context of faculty adoption of technology. Now, again, I want to deconstruct it from faculty, but really think about this as everyone. We're all in this conversation. And I know this is hard to see, uh, but if you do have the slides up on your, on your device, you can tell that on the right over here, so here's our chasm, and obviously this guy's straddling it, being pulled. It's really important to deconstruct this because it's a brilliant image. Over on the right, oops, over on the right, we have the mainstream which is made up of all the way to the right, laggards, skeptics, late majority conservatives, and then the early majority pragmatists. And then we've got the chasm. On the other side of the chasm, we have the ed tech enthusiasts, and those are comprised first of the early adopters, the visionaries, and the innovators, technology enthusiasts. We need to really support this whole spectrum. And I don't think it's impossible. I really don't think it's impossible. Um, but what I want to, what I'm fascinated with is this this guy in the center. And I shared this in a presentation um, back in October, September 2015. I put it on Google Plus. And George Station, who teaches at uh, Cal State University, Monterey Bay, replied on Google Plus with this. He said, yes, I hate being the chasm straddler, though. It's like the guy on the right in this image from Defiance. Now, <laughs> I didn't know what that meant because I've never watched Defiance, so I had to look it up. And if, if anyone knows this narrative and wants to correct what I'm saying, from what I understand, this guy basically ran away from a battle and is feeling horribly guilty. And so he's willingly subjecting himself to torture, to purify himself, make him feel better. Is that a powerful metaphor? 
You know, I mean, really, that, that's really powerful stuff. And then the other thing is, look at what's happening over here. You know, these folks are looking over here. Yeah, some people have their backs turned. But there's a curiosity there that's being piqued, and it's our job to engage that. Um, again, we need to support both sides of the chasm. I want to recognize Phil's great work on that topic. Again, do you see culture of smallness, bigness? We kind of revert into these practices, these assumptions, these perceptions that we have. It, it, it's easier. It's a lot more comfortable to stay there. Yeah, it's their fault, not mine. So we need to get past that. Um, the next one is digital participation. And this is the one that I think I see as being very linked in with um, cost. And I hope that that will come out in some way. Oh, I thought, it, I, thought I lost it. Okay. So digital participation is low in higher education. It's low. And when I say digital participation, I, I mean have your own blog and use it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always prompting my colleague Jill to blog more, so um, because she's got great ideas, that's why. Um, and Twitter, to be connected. How many of you have met people here that in person that you that you actually met virtually first? Some hands are going up. It's happening more and more. Those are the shifts that are starting to occur. These relationships that are fostered virtually. Um, I know Jess Knott and um, Dave Goodrich and someone else is doing a presentation sometime about these cohorts of connection. They met, I think, at this conference, but then they developed their relationship online. So that's a really powerful thing. And I would like to acknowledge the importance and the value of having leaders in an institution who are doing it. Because there are so many people who think, well, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if that would be OK in the context of my institution. So when you work with a leader like Michael Berman, who is the CIO at CSU Channel Islands, who's been named one of the top 50 social CIOs, that says something. It makes me feel like, oh, if I pull out my phone and start tweeting, that's, a, that's recognized as, as a value that we're bringing to our institution and our team by growing my presence and growing my connections. Um, Christopher Long, Dean Long at Michigan State University is another person who's doing amazing things. I'm gonna play this video and I just want you to listen. And you know, if you, maybe you have someone like him, maybe you're from MSU and you work, anyone from MSU in here? No, okay. Um, maybe you have someone on your campus who's doing something like this, but if you don't, imagine how it would turn the tides. One of the values that we hold at a land-grant university like Michigan State is to make knowledge public. As scholars, we want our research to be read. We want our ideas to have an impact on the wider world. As we think about how to build community around the work that we're doing, it's important for us to be intentional about the presence that we have online. I have a, a WordPress blog, and that really is the uh, hub of my academic life. People can go to one place to find out uh, all of the work that I'm doing. One reason I do it is because it's fun. Um, it's, it's part of my own um, process of making meaning out of my life. It's really uh, one space that allows me to think reflectively and in public about my work as an administrator and as a scholar. We've been working with our faculty and with our graduate students to find ways to build community around their work by using uh, digital tools. Through Reclaim Hosting, we're actually able to offer all of our graduate students and all of our faculty a space to create an online presence. Faculty can decide on a, a domain name, uh, a brand for their own work, a, a presence for their uh, scholarship. Students can do the same so that their work really is broadly accessible. Publishers are looking at your online presence. They're thinking about that as they decide whether to offer you a book contract. I've had uh, publishers, they wanted to know how many Twitter followers I had. They wanted to know how many friends on Facebook I had. This is the public face of your work. 
And we need to be thinking strategically about how our work is presented and received. We think that that's going to be good for our students in terms of placement, but we also know that it'll be good for our faculty in terms of the number of citations we see of their work and the broader impact that it has. Okay, so what are your takeaways there? What are you thinking about right now? <laughs> You're welcome. The, um, the infrastructure problem, you know, I'm at a public university, so they can provide for grad students, so they wouldn't be able to take this, it's, it's you know, that's, that's oh. property. If we host it, to pay for that hosting, they'd need to be able to move that, or we, that'd have to be part of how we support them doing it. Right. Oh, sorry. So what she just said was if, if at, at a public institution, if they were to do something like that, they'd have to have a way for students to take it with them. Yeah. That's actually why that exists, the domain of one's own. Um, how many of your institutions with a domains project? There's a link on our at our resource site, good, so a couple of you are, are connected, on our resource site to um, Reclaim Hosting, and they're the ones that um, are now moving forward with this project, and there are dozens of institutions that are using this now. And it's really about giving them a domain and con a, a way to take their worth work with them after they graduate, because we like to use LMSs, right, which we're going to get to, by the way. Again, small, big. The other thing that I take away from this, and this is actually by a medical doctor who quote, had nothing to do with higher education, but he says, you know you're in a supportive culture when being open and transparent is not a risky thing to do. I think people feel very, they, they don't feel comfortable at, at, institutionally to put stuff out there. And I'm seeing some head shakes, so I'm, I'm sensing that you agree. That goes back to our culture. That goes back to our organizational culture, which is a barrier. Um, this is all, another quote from Christopher P. Long. You will be Googled, and when you are, your domain should appear early in the results as the fulcrum of a carefully cultivated online identity. Coming up through K-12, K-12 education does an excellent job of telling students what not to do online. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Don't. Nowhere do they learn what to do. And the value of having a digital presence, that, that's not even part of it. So my son, who's very engaged digitally, um, <clears throat> he doesn't know how to do that. I did buy his domain and his brother's personal domain many years ago. I haven't given it to them yet because I want them to develop some skills before they start building that. Um, but, you know, that's all part of this. And so I think it's a, it's a big piece of what we need to be thinking about. This is just a more a visual image of um, how Chris Long communicates what he does on his WordPress site. Um, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, which I think is a very long name. Anyone from there, by the way? No? Okay. <laughs> Um, they just recently, led by a team of librarians, I understand, um, published a journal article about how they are now linking open access, publishing and open access. They're, they're, it's formally linked into their tenure and promotion process. So trying to find ways to incentivize sharing in the open. So that doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not talking about a blog there, I'm talking about open access journals. But part of this conversation is the more, not, the more we're participating, all of us are participating in putting content out there in the open, the better the content in the open gets, and the more value we start to understand in accessing it and reusing it and contributing it. And then we can start to see more possibilities than using a textbook for a classroom. So this notion of open, OER, that's all part of digital participation. So I, I'm hoping that those are linking up in your mind. And I got this um, mention yesterday from Laura Pasquini on Twitter. She was participating in DLN Chat, which is hosted every month by EdSurge. 
And her comment was, we have not expanded the review for tenure and promo to include tech and learning design as creative efforts. And I thought that was really powerful. Actually, we had just been texting about that. Um, so I took a snapshot of that and put it in my presentation. So when we look back at this chasm, this is all part of the move too. Over on that left side, that's where we start to acquire digital literacy. And we start to look at those, those innovators that are on your campus. I'm sure you know, many of them are in this room. They have to have a place. They have to be lifted up because they're part of this. You know, they're, I always think of innovation as a stew. I always picture the stew. And you know, they're, they're part of you know, keeping the heat going, making the environment. And that's really important. And if they don't feel empowered, then that's a real problem institutionally. So number four, the tool adoption process is one that I recognize a lot of tension with. Um, we know over the past many years, faculty use of social technologies in teaching and learning has increased. So we've seen evidence of that. Uh, this is an a, a illustration that shows the LMS um, ecosystem over on the left side of the late 1990s. And what you see at the top are just you know, four LMS choices and Google and Blogger at the bottom. And then right now we've got you know, more competition in the LMS space and I mean the whole explosion of Web 2.0, right? So that's changed. And so we see faculty who are using a lot of this down here in conjunction with the LMS. When we ask ourselves, okay, well, what is mainstream? When we think about technology adoption in higher education, the one thing that is mainstream is the learning management system. Blackboard, Canvas, something like that, right? Um, and if we look at some of the data that's been collected by the ECAR LMS report, this is uh, from 2014, what are faculty satisfied with when it comes to the LMS? Posting content, receiving course assignments, this is in, in order, managing assignments, entering progress info. The last one, engaging in meaningful interaction with students. What are the three LMS features students are least satisfied with? Collaborating on projects for study groups with other students, engaging in meaningful interaction with other students, engaging in meaningful interaction with instructors. So when we start to think, well, why are faculty using these tools? This is part of the problem because the tools that are mainstream aren't supporting the meaningful interactions. Tool adoption starts at a grassroots level. It starts with those in the trenches who are using it. And that's the first sign that there's a problem when we see, and it doesn't mean that I'm saying then don't let faculty use those tools because I think that's actually the opposite of what I'm saying. That's really important, but I don't think we have processes that enable and empower that and allow us to move from there to adoption. Tool adoption also has to consider this, the way human brains work, the way learning occurs. And if that's, um, you know, I, I realize we're all not, you know, experts in neuroscience, look at Universal Design for Learning, UDL. It's a framework based in neuroscience, research about what we know about the human brain. That should be part of this. And this links back to my lightning talk, by the way. Um, and this, we know that there are, um, of faculty in higher education, one in five are on a full-time tenure track, in a full-time tenure track position now, one in five. So we have to be asking the part-time faculty, well, what are you using? And why are you using it? And how's it going? Do you have evidence that it's effective? What is that evidence? Those conversations are core to tool adoption. And too frequently, we see the adoption being made from the top down. And without thinking about, OK, well, how is it different when you're teaching a purely online class? And why would we might need different tools for that type of teaching and learning environment? And lastly, it has to include the students. So I kind of wove that in there with the, you know, getting the feedback and pulling that into the conversation. So this is a quote from um, my dissertation. I did a study of faculty who taught with a tool called VoiceThread, third-party tool, 
and I wanted to get to know what their their needs were, you know, what the problems were. Some of the then I, one of the things that that came out of this that was very interesting were the the tensions that I identified. This is a part-time faculty member said, I want to use the gradebook integration for VoiceThread, and I don't like my students creating their own accounts, but my administration won't buy a site-wide license until more faculty use the tool. Do you see the, the conflicts there? So yeah, it, it, often we hear you know, from the top, well, fac students can't be creating their own accounts. OK, so let's talk about a way to get around that. But, Getting around that involves a site-wide license, which allows for single sign-on, gradebook integration. Oh, but we can't do that until we have more evidence of proof of, of use, user adoption. That's, that's a lot of tension. That's, that's something to be recognized. Um, and then this, I stripped out her identity. Uh, the second edition of my book, a little plug for myself, is coming out in May. And I talked to a lot of faculty. And um, this was a, a faculty member, part-time faculty member, who was using Web 2.0 tools in her class. And she wrote to me and said, hope your new edition has been finished. Just thought I would update you. I'm no longer adjuncting. Because as my dean said, my use of Web 2.0 tools was problematic because it wasn't in related to her discipline. And those are the things no one's talking about. And they happen all the time. So. You know, the way this works, the red arrow is the login process. So we've got the LMS over here on the left with the secure institutional login. If faculty are teaching with third-party tools, the students and the instructors are logging in a different way. And that's the exchange of, of, of student data. And that's a concern. Well, if we figure out a way to adopt tools that are functional, that are making an impact, that we have evidence of improving the student experience in some way, we can use something called LTI, or Learning Tools Interoperability. And what that allows for is for basically a tool to be integrated with the learning management system and integrated with single sign-on. And then the exchange that goes through here, the student data, is, is minimal. And you can also work with the tool provider to customize your own terms of service. So that's something we need to be working towards. The fifth barrier to innovation, which we presented on earlier today, is time and place. Time and place. It's really fascinating in higher education how we have identified that if we, if we start to eliminate time and place as a barrier for student learning, different types of students get access to higher education. Right? But we haven't really applied that to our institutional workplace. When there's something important happening, we still expect everyone to be in one room at one time. Um, and professional development and training are major factors affecting technological innovation within higher education organizations. So getting faculty to understand what the principles of effective teaching and learning are, how to apply technology in support of that pedagogy, that's critical. But what we also see is that 9 out of 10 institutions provide professional development for online instructors through face-to-face -face delivery. So come to this room at this place and time and you'll learn how to teach a purely online class. Does that make sense to anyone? So, you know, why is it that if, we're, if we want a faculty member to really understand the power and the dynamism of an online class, we talk to them about it. We need to get them in online classes where they're not required to come to campus where they are expected to carve out extra time in their schedule, just like our students are who take online classes. Not only is that a good way to immerse them in the environment, but it's also a really powerful way to build empathy and have conversations about empathy throughout that process. So we are really good about connecting faculty with faculty on campus, but we really aren't good at connecting faculty with faculty virtually or enabling them to have access to conversations occurring in a room when they can't get to campus. And so some of the ways, oh, some faculty views about just-in-time PD, uh, these are also taken from my, my dissertation. Uh, faculty actually learned through an ebook about how to teach with VoiceThread. I didn't have to go anymore, anywhere, I had more freedom. I could only attend a face-to-face -face event at one of the three institutions at which I teach. I am at the center in a workshop. I'm passive most of the time. 
Those are some powerful takeaways. So you want to think about improving access. If, if you look at your workshops and think, well, nobody came, let's throw that one out the window. No! Maybe nobody came because the time and the place were the barriers. And what we're also finding at Channel Islands, um, where we're in, coming about this notion of untethered faculty development, is that the more we untether what we're doing and invite more faculty in, in various ways to gain access to the conversations and the resources, we're starting to engage a broader range of that chasm. So think about that. Think about the folks over on the right side of the chasm who were kind of you know, lurking. Like, I'm kind of curious. Those people are way more interested to go to a site and look at some kind of archive or read some resources or read a blog post from a faculty that has you know, written a post about how they've transformed their teaching and learning. So expanding what you're doing into that, that virtual untethered space. This is me and my team. Hey. And Heather's here from Channel Islands too. One of our faculty members. And this is an image of one of our untethered workshops. And this is just part of it, by the way. There's kind of a before, a during, and an after process to untethering. This is the during. So we use Zoom. And um, I work remotely for, Channel Island, for CSU Channel Islands. And so it started with me kind of coming in remotely. And then we're like, well, why can't faculty do this too? And so we give that option to participate remotely. And just a visual of uh, what we're doing. So we, we reach out to faculty in so many different ways, um, really trying to leverage the connections of our social era, kind of like that model by um, Phil Long. We push our content out to YouTube. We have a blog that faculty are now blogging on. Didn't start that way. It was mostly our team members. And over the past couple of years, now it's all fac all the posts are faculty driven. They're reflecting on what they're doing in their classroom. And those posts are getting pushed out to Twitter and Facebook. And we're finding that that's another way to reach people. We're faculty are reading stuff on Facebook. And then they kind of find their way into our studio and have conversations with us. Uh, we're using Canvas. We started using the free version of Canvas to teach part of our online teaching preparation program, Humanizing Online Learning, which we had a really a lot of interest in from people at other institutions. So we put in the free version of Canvas, and, which allows for you to let other people take it. And so we've, we've invited a few people in each semester. And now we have that curriculum that we've shared with a Creative Commons license. It's been adopted. Oh, I need to update this. Um, at Santa Barbara City College, Ventura College, and CSU, where's Kim? Humboldt. Um, and those are, you know, all our neighboring, our partnering community colleges. We're a four year university, which is really powerful because most, so many of our students transfer from those locations. So, again, big versus small. What happens if you, if you break down the walls and invite people in and put what you're doing out there? We regularly are, are contacted by people. Just this morning, we met someone who said, oh, we read your stuff all the time. Thank you for sharing. We learn so much. Um, another really fun idea that comes from Todd Conaway up at the University of Washington Bothell. Um, he reached out to us a couple months ago, and he's doing these uh, things called, his first thing was called a five-day workout. And it was totally asynchronous. And he designed it so faculty over five days, if they could commit to spending 20 minutes a day at any time of the day, but 20 minutes a day to learning how to do something in Canvas, by the end of the week, they're going to have a new collection of, of skills. Very low barrier. And it was very fun. He, and, and he invited me in, and I participated in his first discussion. I left a video from Lake Tahoe, where I was with my family. Um, and so, again, that notion of untethering really kind of working its way in there. And by the way, he shared this with a, in the public domain. So if you go to that link at the bottom of the slide and you have the slides, remember, you can actually see this and adopt it and adapt it as your own. OK, so here they are. Culture of smallness, perceptions of faculty, digital participation, tool adoption process, time and place. If you have that resource page up, which I should have put at the bottom of the slide again, would have been brilliant, but I didn't. There's a vote button. And I would like you to go there. Oops, let me try this again.
Someone raise their hand if they're there and they can vote. Okay, good. Is it working? So if you don't have access to that site, the link to get to this poll is pollev.com slash mpbrock. pollev.com slash mpbrock. Which barrier do you encounter most in your role? <laughs> Isn't that cool to watch that? So it looks like things are settling down. Perceptions of faculty and culture of smallness are leading the way. We are, um, we have time, this is great. We have time, about eight minutes. Here's what I would like you to do. And if you're an introvert and you don't wanna share, then just listen, that's fine. <laughs> totally get that. Have a conversation with those around you. Share what you clicked on here. Or maybe you don't want to do that, huh? Okay. If you feel like you're not in a supportive environment, you don't have to share. Okay? We are here to support and encourage all of you. But I realize there may be other issues with sharing. You get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but let's, let's just spend you know, a minute or two, have, some con have a brief conversation with your peers about which one you selected and why, if, if you feel comfortable doing that. Maybe groups of three or four. Step into that arena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're just sharing in small groups. If you could reflect on what you clicked on and why. Yeah, or maybe that, that's a better question, actually. I should have I done that. Well then, yeah, share what you didn't click on and maybe why. What are you doing well? That's what we need to hear more about here, huh? Sorry. No, that's okay. Okay, why don't we wrap up those thoughts? <laughs> Thanks, Christy. How did that feel? Did that feel good to be able to talk about that a little bit? Does it feel good to recognize that other people kind of can relate and it's not just it's not just you? Huh? They really were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so here's someone in the back said, oh, I, wanna, I, feel, I feel like I want to talk about what I didn't click on. And I thought that would have been such a powerful conversation, too. So here's what I want you to do. Okay, you have homework. We're going to untether this. 
You all have access um, to a doc, which I'll get to in a minute. I'll go back to that. Start small, be big. That's my call to action for you all. And those who jump will never fly. Remember that. So there's our link. If you didn't go to the site, write it down now. Um, I have a, quest a place in that, that doc for questions, but maybe someone can take the lead and make a, a heading on that doc for um, strategies. And you know, if you've got an idea from your campus that you think is really you know, addressing one of those barriers, that would be so awesome if you'd be willing to share that and who you are and how we can get in touch with you. And blog about it. And then share the blog link with OLC Innovate hashtag. That would be really, really wonderful. Start to put some of that into practice. Um, I do want to go back real quick. And I skipped over this one slide. Peter Senge's work, uh, he's written a lot about change, like at a systemic level. His work, it, it, I, he, when I started reading his stuff, I was like, oh my god. Like, I, could, I was so pulled in. It's, it's fascinating. But his work really looks at how identifying shared values among ecosystem partners moves us from fragmentation to relatedness. That's a really powerful statement. And when we can start to participate digitally, connect with our peers outside of campus, recognize who's got shared barriers and solutions to those barriers, we are starting to use our ecosystem partners as, as what they are, partners. And you know what? That also goes to tool providers, I have to say. You know, if there's a tool that someone on your campus is using and seeing amazing successes with, but maybe it's not quite accessible, it's not 508 compliant, or there's some other issue with it, reach out to them. Give them the context of your issue. They want to hear it, and they want to help improve that. So they're partners too. You know, workforce leaders, companies, those are our partners too. And that's really where the solutions are. So I just wanted to acknowledge his work because um, it's a, it's a great place to start reading up on some of these ideas. And we are at the end of our time together. So thank you for being here, everybody.